Hello, everybody. Welcome to New Consciousness Review. My name is Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Chef Barton Seaver. Barton is an influential voice in the culinary world because of his take on seafood and sustainability. He's one of the champions of the locavore movement, and he starred in a TV miniseries, In Search of Food, which focused on local farmers, chefs, and food specialists in New York, San Francisco, and Minneapolis. In his first book that we're going to be discussing today, Barton introduces an entirely new kind of casual cooking that features seafood that has not been overfished or harvested using destructive methods. His book is called For Cod and Country, Simple, Delicious, Sustainable Cooking. And I can tell you firsthand that it lives up to its name. Welcome, Barton Seaver. Well, thank you so much, Miriam. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. I'm just delighted to have received your book for review because I have been enjoying it immensely. In fact, it's the one cookbook that I keep on top of the counter instead of in my bookshelf. Oh, well, that's nice to hear. Thanks. Now, I understand from reading the book and from some background material that your philosophy is that food should be go- both healthful and bring you joy that it should bring together family and build an understanding of our place within the global community. You gave such an evocative introduction to your book about your childhood around the family dinner table and, and a memorable flounder meal off the Long Island coast that got you started. Mm. So tell us, tell us a bit about your background and what brought you into this specific niche. Well, in fact, I uh, was born and raised in a very interesting multi-ethnic neighborhood called Mount Pleasant in Washington, D.C., and it's sort of just a, a Noah's Ark of people, and it was an, old, uh, an older neighborhood, and it's just filled with embassy workers, international uh, foreign exchange students, uh, Latino community from nearly every Central American nation, Eritreans, Ethiopians, Koreans, and uh, my family, we were born and raised, I was born and raised here, and you know, we would shop in two different ways. First, we'd go off to the, the, the grocery store once a week on Sundays and kind of bulk up. But we'd also spend a lot of time walking just a block or two up the street to all of these different ethnic markets and mm-hmm. buying what was fresh, buying what was interesting, buying what was neat or, or new. And my parents were both very intrepid cooks, uh, which was good because they were also very good cooks. And so the, the food was tasty. But uh, family dinner was an integral part of my upbringing, uh, a part of my family. In fact, where the members of my family coalesced and really became a group. And it was the act of cooking every night that really gave us that time together. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, you can imagine the little toehead boys, my brother and I, we'd be football out in the, in the street uh, with all of our neighbors, you know, in the waning hours of the afternoon light and and then we'd be called home to dinner and my dad would have just gotten home from work and we'd be pressing out the moistened masa harina dough in a, in a taco press and then dry searing the the tortillas in a in a pan in a castile pan you know and, and my brother and i just so rapturously and wondered with this thing that was so cool so new but yet literally represents eons of cultural history to the boys and girls that we had been playing with all afternoon and so we really began to see, or, or I sort of grew up with food as a, as a fluency and as a means to understand the people that were all around me. And, uh, you know, it was that fluency, which when I dropped out of college and was looking for some structure in my life, which allowed me to very easily jump into the restaurant community. Mm-hmm. While I wasn't necessarily a good cook, I was fluent in food. So <laughs> I, I got it, and it was just easy for me to start in on it. And I really began to, to enjoy it. And what I loved about it was the communion of food. You know, how food and its production really brings us together. And I found great joy and solace in that. And, uh, and in fact, that's what drove my, um, drove my career for many years in restaurants. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, that's sort of what For Cod and Country is. My book is sort of a reclamation to me as, as a you know, moving away from the role of a chef to really the role of the cook and reclaiming uh, those memories, those experiences of how food really brings people together 
and uh, well, I had great that, fun writing it. There's so much nostalgia that you have that description. Um, you associate kind of gathering around the big family dinner table, particularly with ethnic communities um, still, because I have the feeling that a lot of that experience has been lost in the modern family where everybody is working so hard and fast food has become the order of the day. So kudos to you for campaigning to bring that spirit back. Well, thanks. And I think even beyond that, uh, in Travels around the country and in the world. Uh, I, I work as a, a National Geographic fellow, uh, and I spend a lot of time exploring how food is is a is a window of exploration to to how we relate to each other, our communities, and our natural world. And I really began to see you know, some of the externalities of the convenience foods movement. Uh, and I'm not necessarily bashing it because a lot of good has come with convenience foods. Uh, you know, women have been freed up from their traditional role uh, in order to join the workplace, you know, to really uh, seek and to find that equality, uh, you know, and God bless it. You know, I mean, there, there are some very good cultural things which have come from a little bit more independence from the farm, more independence from the kitchen. Uh, but there are also some very negative things. And mm-hmm. in my experience, once we removed the culture from agriculture, once we removed American culture away from these small town communities where everybody chipped in for everyone else's benefit, uh, we've really professionalized the role of the neighbor in our society and also increasingly so of the family. You know, the, yes. the hungry, the poor, the sick, the aging, the homeless, uh, they were all taken care of by the family or by the extended community within, you know, in our recent past. And now we have largely a nonprofit industry, which has sprung up to care for those needs. Uh, you know, we kind now, of a depersonalization, uh, or a professionalization. Yeah, and 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 I think we're now doing a lot of the same thing with food. Uh, and if you look at the burden that we place upon our school food systems to portray and, and become the role of the family to incubate those values of not only nutrition but the manners of. Uh, interactive skills, uh, relationship skills. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, we're really mm-hmm. getting away from what I feel is, is the fundamental purpose of eating, which is to sustain us spiritually, communally, uh, in a family sense, in an indiv- individual sense, also in a health sense. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's time that we sort of vigorously research the values that we've left behind and try and incorporate uh, the best of those values into our modern system. And most well, of that you, begins you, with, with sitting around the table. Right, and you, you take it um, to the level of the, the market and actually purchasing your food, um, and you've been uh, supporting the locavore movement, buying local and sustainable foods. So your, your, your current cookbook focuses on sustainable seafood, which is a movement I hadn't really heard of until I picked up your book. Tell us about that. Well, in, in our very recent history, uh, probably within the past five decades or so, we have, uh, we've frankly eaten too many fish. Uh, and fisheries really represents a very difficult uh, understanding because it's the last wild food that we eat on a massive scale. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's really hunting of sorts. And um, unfortunately, we have eaten more fish than, than we should have. We have discarded unnecessarily fish that we should have eaten. Uh, and in doing so, we've damaged the natural ecosystems that support us. Um, and unfortunately, the sustainable, se- well, the sustainable seafood movement, just to stay on this pack for a second, is about... Uh, realizing how we can continue to fish, uh, continue to support uh, hard-working fishing communities, how can we can continue to partake of the healthful and delicious bounty of the oceans in a way that uh, ensures that those ecosystems will stay intact uh, for generations, for years to come. And uh, it's really a very exciting movement, uh, but it's one that's it's very complicated. And unfortunately, fishermen tend to get the bear the brunt of, of the of the criticism here, 
Uh, and it's easy to do so because, well, it's the fishermen that took the fish out of the ocean. But none of us are absent of blame here because uh, we, we all ate the fish. We're the ones mm-hmm. supporting uh, fisheries through our dollars, through our consumption. And so it's really uh, not a burden, I would say, but really an opportunity that we have as consumers to support hardworking American jobs, to support good nutrition, and uh, to ultimately get back to what really drives dinner, which is delicious. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a language we all speak. So. <laughs> um, you focus on uh, making informed choices among the fish that you uh, demand in the market. So what varieties should we be looking for that um, are not endangered? Uh, and, and, you know, what ones are endangered and how can we make sub- substitutes? I know that you include a lot of that information in your book, but give us a general uh, overview. Well, I'll tell you, the general overview is to start off by saying it's super complicated and it's always changing. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, fisheries are an incredibly resilient force. And so uh, what I can tell you today might not be accurate six months from now. Uh, it might have gotten worse. It might have gotten a lot better. Um, so as sort of a, a, uh, a first salvo here, I would check with the Blue Ocean Institute or with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Both organizations run a fantastic uh, little wallet guide program, which is a, a simple listing of species in, both, in green, yellow, and red categories. Mm-hmm. And while I think it's a, a bit oversimplified, it's a great first step. There's things like uh, you know, sardines, um, some forms of tilapia that are farmed uh, domestically. You have uh, you know, some of the Alaskan salmon. You have Dungeness crab. I mean, some of the great iconic species of our, of our country that are, are really doing very well and really should be eaten uh, with respect in moderation, but we should eat them. We should take mm-hmm. part in their incredibly delicious, moist, you know, sensual texture of that soft dungeness creamy with that slight toothsome bite just at the end and that salty, briny, sweet flavor. Woo! Mix that with just a, <laughs> you know, a little bit of olive oil and some dill. Throw it on top as a garnish and some, 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 you know, some hot, sweet butternut squash soup, lightly perfumed with garlic and then boiled down in just uh, its own juices. Woo! You know, talk about a great meal. You know, that's an opportunity <laughs> right there, not only to support fishermen, but to get your family actually to sit down to the table and say, whoa, but also oh. to inject great nutrition into, into our daily lives. Um, oh, wow, well, you're making me hungry, Mark. <laughs> we're we're going to have well, that's to... that's the purpose. <laughs> We're going to have to take a little break, so... Uh, <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll calm Slurp down. Slurp up I'll your cool saliva. <laughs> Slurp up your saliva and hang on, and we'll be right back with our guest, Barton Seaver. 